Hi guys, I'm back today with another true crime story, another one that I had never heard of and it's an older one so I can't believe I never heard about this but trigger warning, viewer discretion is absolutely advised. This case is horrifying, um, it does talk about abuse and specifically sexual abuse of children as well as murder and various other sensitive topics. So. If you need to protect your mental health, please do so, as that always comes first. Otherwise, let's get into it. The case we're going to be discussing today is that of Nathaniel Bar Jonah. It is a long story, so this is going to be a long video, as I'm sure you're now aware, but I think this would be a good one to put on while you're just kind of cleaning your house or drawing or doing something that requires your visual attention, but you have time to listen. So, just going to throw that out there. Do as you will. As always, my laptop is down here, so if you see me looking down, that is why. I can't remember everything. <laughs> Alright. Nathaniel Bar Jonah was born as David Brown in Massachusetts in 1957. And he goes on to change his name, which is what I will be calling him throughout this video, as that is what he's currently known as, and it just kind of helps if you were to Google it. That's what you're going to look up is Nathaniel Bar Jonah. Nathaniel Bar Jonah is a child molester and suspected serial killer. His first crime was at only seven years old when he lured a neighbor girl into his basement by telling her that he had a Ouija board that could predict her future. And luckily for the little girl, her screams alerted his mother, who then came to her rescue, and nothing ever came of it. He wasn't even really punished for the situation. And... Unfortunately, that was just the first of many, many crimes that Bar Jonah committed. In January of 1970, at only 12 years old, Bar Jonah would commit his next crime by luring yet another neighbor child, this time a six year old boy, to a nearby hill under the pretense of going sledding. However, once they arrived, Bar Jonah proceeded to sexually assault the little boy. Um, a six year old boy at this point and a five year old girl. His next victims were two boys, and this is just a few years later. They were out riding their bikes, and Barb Jonah attempted to lure them to a cemetery with the intention of assaulting and murdering them. However, and thankfully, one of the boys became suspicious and persuaded his friend not to go. And thankfully, the friend did listen. In March of 1975, which was Barb Jonah's senior year of high school, he dressed up as an officer and kidnapped eight-year-old Richard O'Connor while he was on his way to school. And he proceeded to sexually assault as well as strangle O'Connor. And thankfully, a neighbor witnessed the abduction as well as the attack and called it into the police who found a vehicle fitting the description given in a parking lot parked away from the other vehicles. And after calling for backup, they approached the vehicle and Bar Jonah was arrested, and O'Connor was found alive, but near the point of death. The part that really blows my mind is the fact that Bar Jonah was arrested and sentenced to only a couple months of probation, as in May of 1975, he drove to nearby Hartford, Connecticut, and abducted a nine-year-old girl who was out riding her bike and proceeded to sexually assault as well as beat her. And she only escaped with her life because she began convulsing and vomiting during the attack. So Bar Jonah pushed her out of the vehicle onto the sidewalk. And thankfully, a pedestrian saw and reported the incidents as well as got Bar Jonah's license plate number. And he was yet again arrested. And faced no time somehow as the report did not get back to his probation officer. And then, yeah. He got to graduate high school and his probation ended. He even received a letter in the mail thanking him for his cooperation, which is mind-boggling. I can't wrap my head around that. I don't, I don't understand how he managed to get away with all of these things. Not once, but twice after being arrested for the same crime. 
Okay, so then, on September 24th in 1977, while impersonating an FBI agent this time, Barjona abducted two boys coming out of a movie theater. He drove them to a remote area where he handcuffed and then proceeded to torture them for an unknown amount of time. And one of the boys was put on the ground and Bar Jonah, who was 375 pounds at that time, proceeded to jump on his chest over and over again until the boy stopped moving and he thought he was dead. The boy who he hadn't been jumping on was left in the trunk of his car and Bar Jonah drove off. Thankfully, the child he'd been jumping on was only pretending to be dead and managed to get up and go get help and once again, Bar Jonah was arrested and the boy in the trunk was found alive. Bar Jonah would strike yet again on September 24th of 1977 when he would abduct two boys who were coming out of a movie theater. Um, he took them to a remote area where he handcuffed and tortured them for an unknown amount of time. And then he would proceed to attempt to strangle one of the boys as well as suffocate him with his weight because Barjona at this time was around 375 pounds. He did so until the little boy stopped moving and Barjona assumed he was dead. So he put the remaining boy in his trunk and drove off. Thankfully, the little boy was only pretending to be dead and was able to get up and go get help. Barjona was found, arrested, and the second boy was found in the trunk of Barjona's car, still alive. I forgot to mention that he had actually changed his name from David Brown to Nathaniel Barjona in March of 1984, stating that he wanted to know what it was like to be discriminated against and persecuted as a Jewish man. And he would later claim in an interview for some TV show that he was in fact a Jewish man and just wanted his name to properly reflect that. Bar Jonah was released from Bridgewater State Hospital in July of 1991 and only a month later on August 9th of 1991 committed his next crime. Bar Jonah observed a seven-year-old boy sitting inside a parked car outside of a post office and proceeded to open the door and climb into the car sitting on top of the boy in an attempt to suffocate him. However, of course, there were people around the boy's mother saw it as well as random civilians and Bar Jonah fled the scene. Thankfully, there was an officer present who had arrested Bar Jonah 15 years prior and recognized the description given. Bar Jonah was once again arrested and stated that he had no intentions to harm the boy. He didn't even know the boy was in the car at the time of entering it, so any injury caused was purely accidental. But he would later admit that his, he had intended to kill the little boy. And for this crime, Barjona was sentenced to two years of probation under the um, condition that he moved to Great Falls, Montana to live with his mother. And he did just that. He moved to Great Falls, Montana to live with his mother and immediately began collecting toys, Star Wars memorabilia, various things like that, as well as holding large yard sales full of children's items. And... <laughs> His first brush with the law in Montana was only in December of 1993 when he was accused of molesting a boy that he had been babysitting. Bar Jonah's defense in the situation was that didn't make any sense because if he had done that, clearly he would have killed the boy and the boy was still alive, so he had done nothing wrong. And believe it or not, Bar Jonah got off on the fact that his lawyer stated his right to a speedy trial had been denied. So once again, Bar Jonah walks free. Now we're moving on to the case of Zachary Ramsey. Zachary Ramsey was a 10-year-old boy who went missing on February 6th of 1996. He left his house at approximately 7.35 that morning to go to school and took the path that he would usually take. It was through an alleyway near the 400 block of 4th Street North. And this is in Great Falls, Montana. Um, he was wearing a denim jacket with green sleeves, a blue football jersey with his name on the back and gold lettering, as well as stonewashed jeans and black high-top sneakers. A family of three who lived in the apartment in the alleyway stated that they remember seeing Ramsey there that morning and also reported seeing an off-white four-door vehicle nearly run him over. 
Another witness would claim that they also saw Ramsey there and that he almost appeared to be waiting for someone and they weren't sure why or who. Um, yeah, another witness who lived near the end of the alleyway reported seeing Ramsey distressed with an obese white male following him at around 7.45 in the morning. And a witness reported seeing Bar Jonah standing near a dumpster in the alleyway around that same time. And yet again, Bar Jonah at this time was wearing a Navy police-like jacket, and the same witness stated that they had seen Ramsey enter this alleyway around the same time um, Bar Jonah was still standing near the dumpster, um, just kind of hanging out for some strange reason. Okay, and somewhere between where the alley cuts into 6th Street and comes out at 7th Street, Ramsey disappeared and has never been seen since. And despite the objections of Ramsey's mother, a judge declared him legally dead in 2011, which I find incredibly sad and I can only imagine the pain that woman was feeling. Police investigations conducted years later would actually prove that Bar Jonah had access to his mother's vehicle, which was an off-white four-door four door 1997 Toyota Corolla the day that Ramsey went missing, as well as the fact that Bar Jonah actually did not work on February 6th of 1966 or the days immediately preceding. Detective Bill Belushi was given the case to investigate and he was the detective who had investigated the prior incident in 1993 involving Bar Jonah and the eight-year-old boy. Belushi was given a list of registered sex offenders in the area and although Bar Jonah was not on that list as he was not registered, Belushi chose to focus on him. He attempted to get a warrant to search the house belonging to Bar Jonah and his mother, but was turned down because he had no legitimate reasoning for that warrant. Although I would disagree, I would say his prior crimes were reason enough, but I'm not a judge, so. Not long after the Ramsey disappearance, Bar Jonah actually moved out of his mother's house. Seems a little suspicious to me, kind of weird timing, considering the whole premise of him moving to Great Falls, Montana was that he was to live with his mother and never return to Massachusetts and yet he moves out of his mother's house after only a couple of years. On December 13th, 1999, Bar Jonah was seen outside an elementary school for the third time in a few days and was reported to the authorities. He was said to be wearing a dark navy jacket, a knit cap, carrying pepper spray, as well as a badge and a toy gun. Despite the fact that their colleagues disagreed, Belushi and the Attorney General charged Bar Jonah with impersonating an officer and carrying a concealed weapon, so at least he got something. Finally, finally, thankfully, a judge approved a search warrant for impersonation objects at Bar Jonah's mother's house as well as his new address. During the search, officers found two Navy jackets, one with a toy badge in the pocket. They found another toy badge, a stun gun, and a baseball cap, which read security enforcement. They also found a pulley on the ceiling of Bar Jonah's kitchen, as well as two albums containing cutouts of children and two documents containing information about um, bondage and autoerotic asphyxia. Just two days later, Belushi was granted a second warrant to search the house for any documents and photographic material. While searching Barjona's apartment, they found a list of boys' names which included previous victims and a Zachary Ramsey, where the name had been misspelled with the word died after it. They also found dozens of newspaper clippings referring to the Ramsey case, which says a lot in my opinion. They found 3,500 photos of children and three undeveloped film rolls containing photos of Bar Jonah and three unknown boys. Investigators also found notebooks with seemingly random characters that they believed to be coded writing. And with the help of the FBI, after months of effort, the writing was finally decoded. In it, Bar Jonah described torturing and eating children, and there were also macabre recipes involving children's body parts like little boy pie, french fried children, and little boy stew. When investigators sprayed Bar Jonah's garage with a phosphorus material while investigating his involvement in the Ramsey disappearance, the word TITA appeared, T-I-T-A, 
which led authorities to believe that Bar Jonah may have been responsible for the abduction of James Tita, a Massachusetts boy who was kidnapped on August 23rd of 1973. Tita's body was uh, discovered on August 25th, 1973 in Ridge, New Hampshire, off Route 119. An autopsy revealed that he had been raped and strangled. So that's pretty scary, too. There are no telling how many victims this man had that were never discovered. A former roommate of Barjona described finding clothes in his apartment which appeared to match those that Ramsey had been wearing the day he disappeared, as well as finding bloody gloves. Yet another roommate claimed that Barjona sometimes randomly brought Zachary Ramsey up in conversation and was reported to have said that Ramsey would never be found because he had been cut up and been scattered in random places. <sighs> Unfortunately, it was thought that Bar Jonah had murdered and cooked Ramsey and later found out that he had held cookouts after Ramsey had disappeared for friends and neighbors in which the meat was said to have tasted strange. And when Bar Jonah was questioned by the attendants of said cookouts, he said that it was deer meat and that he had hunted, killed, wrapped, butchered and wrapped the meat himself. However, it was found that Bar Jonah had no guns and no hunting license and that he did not buy any kind of groceries for about a month after Ramsey went missing. Now whether or not that means anything the police weren't sure because he could have just paid in cash or stocked up beforehand but the police think that the reasoning is he consumed Zachary Ramsey. Hair that resembled a human hair was found in a meat grinder owned by Bar Jonah, which I find strange anyway. The average person doesn't own a meat grinder, so that would have set off red flags for me. Um, and an excavation at a former residence of Bar Jonah found 21 bone fragments belonging to a boy between 8 and 13 years old. Unfortunately, the house's pipes could not be examined because new owners had them replaced due to them constantly being clogged, which again, I think is very telling that he was likely rinsing things down the sink that he shouldn't have been that causes them to clog repeatedly. The DNA found in the hair as well as the bone fragments matched two different African-American males, neither of which was Ramsey. Um, and Ramsey's mother refused to believe that her son was dead or that Barjona was involved in his disappearance in any way as a psychic had convinced her that he was alive and well in Italy. Two names on a list of potential victims matched the identity of two boys living in the same apartment complex as Bar Jonah, and upon questioning the boys, one stated that Bar Jonah had invited them over for a sleepover and proceeded to molest them and take pictures. Another boy maintained that Bar Jonah did nothing wrong and even wrote to him in jail and referred to him as a friend, stating that he had never done any harm to the boy. So Bar Jonah was arrested in 1999 for the impersonation of an officer. And due to the evidence they found in his residence, he was actually prosecuted for the abduction and molestation of the three boys in the films that were found and convicted of kidnapping, aggravated assault, and sexual assault, including charges that he had tortured one of the boys by hanging him from the pulley that was found in his kitchen. Um, prosecutors announced that they would actually be seeking the death penalty. Unfortunately, Zachary Ramsey's mother was swayed by Bar Jonah's defense because she did not believe her son was dead and so unfortunately the jury could not convict him for the murder of Zachary Ramsey. However, the jury did state that they believed Bar Jonah was a dangerous sexual deviant and child predator. And also during his trial, 36-year-old Mary Petrone recognized him as the man who had abducted and assaulted her by dressing as a police officer in 1974. Unfortunately, the statute of limitations had passed so that there, there was nothing that could be done. Um, Barjona was also assumed to have committed another kidnapping of a seven-year-old girl named Janice Pocket 10 months earlier in 1974. So there are no telling, again, how many crimes went unknown. Thankfully, Barjona was sentenced to 130 years in prison and... He died in prison. He maintained his innocence up until the day he died, which was April 13th, 2008, and he died from a heart attack. Those are the facts of this case. 
Despite the fact that this video is probably already disgustingly long and you guys are probably so tired and emotionally drained from listening, I have so many questions. Like, how did this man keep slipping through the police's fingers? How did he keep escaping a system that was designed to imprison men like him? He committed so many crimes. He got caught so many times. He wasn't sneaky. He wasn't skilled at what he was doing by any means. He repeatedly got caught. He never learned his lesson in any way. How was this man able to go free continuously and keep committing the same exact crimes over and over and over again? I don't understand that. Why was he allowed to leave Massachusetts where all of his crimes were known and move to Montana where his name was completely unheard of, where he could just start committing crimes all over again, which is exactly what he did. He completely flew under the radar in Montana because he wasn't registered as a sex offender. He was able to just keep committing his crimes. This predator was roaming free, got let out of prison after, from a 18 to 20 year sentence, he only served a few years, really, maybe 10 years of that, I think, at most. I'm not even sure it was that much. I I can't comprehend this case. I surely don't know. I am exhausted after doing all the research for this case. Some of the dates and things like that were mixed up, it seemed like. I looked at multiple different sites and just tried to kind of compile the best that I could based on what matched up. Some of these dates might be off from what you read if you Google it yourself. I just tried my hardest to piece the timeline together when there seemed to be multiple different timelines on different sites. So yeah, anyway guys, I'm gonna go. I'm tired and <laughs> my head hurts. So I wanna say I hope you enjoyed this video, but I hope you didn't enjoy this video. I just please be careful. Please watch your children. It's a scary world out there. Anyway, bye guys. Have a great day or a great evening, good morning, whatever. Just take care of yourself, okay? That's all I can say today. Just take care of yourself and take care of others. Bye-bye.